So let us remember that as we march in this journey of the Christ conscious feelings, remind ourselves that when Jesus came, he came to be our guiding model to what? So we can be good children of God. That's why he's the model and he's a guide because he's not the ultimate goal of our lives. He's the guidance of our lives. The goal is God. In the Spirit's book, we learn that to be happy, we need to fulfill God's will. So that feeling of duty, if it's not there, we go nowhere. So rebelliousness in life is the opposite of duty. And as Mentor Joseph was saying in the prayer, this duty feeling towards God begins with the creatures of God. If we disrespect people here, we disrespect God. If we disrespect and if we're rebellious to people here, we disrespect God. So let us get to know more about it because Leo prepared a whole study based on this to give us a true banquet of light so we can be happier and make people happier as well as we fulfill God's will and make others fulfill God's will as well. Especially our children, we would like to highlight you children who are here, Sarah, Juliana, and Luciana, you are very blessed. We're blessed that you're here and you're blessed because you are one of the few children in this country of the millions. They have the privilege of being in touch with one of the most important thoughts in humanity. This is a true treasure. And according to what the spirits say, they say childhood is the most important phase in which we can blossom our capacities and aptitudes that can be favored by these teachings. So we would say pay very much attention to what Leo, your dad, and your uncle Leo is going to say, because we will as well, to make sure that we, when we grow up, we suffer less and are happier as well. All right. Taking from what Vanessa just brought to us, Right? We're excited, we're here, and whether we're getting frozen liquid, liquid sunshine coming from the sky, <laughs> we're still here, we're still together. Taking from this approach that you just said, that when we're rebellious, we're going against this. So we're going to do the opposite. We're here, we're happy, and we're going to emphasize this more and more, because when we look at this word and say, duty, wow, it's pretty heavy, isn't it? The duty, obligation, right? It's like, okay, but let's try to understand this, <coughs> excuse me, with a different eye, for a different heart. Perhaps I'm, I'm excited um, more than ever, you know, bringing this, this topic tonight because I've been studying, been reading these things, bring this to you, and I hope to transpose this to you with this happy heart because, as Vanessa said, we can't be in that rebellious mode that we have that really hard face um, and towards life and towards everything, right? So let's take this, dive into this consideration tonight, this talk, by having just, just a glimpse of what is duty. What is duty for? Is it our duty to be here tonight? Is it our duty to do, um, to cope with our obligations? Is it our duty to be this or that or to do this or that, right? Let's try and understand from Wikipedia, just something simple for us to kind of get there, for, to warm our, our muscles. Duty, it's um, from do meaning that which is owing, old French to do, did pass participle of the devor, the Latin, debere, debitum, um, when's that, is a term that conveys a sense of moral commitment to someone or something. Let's just go back real quick. Someone or something. So it's a person or a situation. And we're going to dive a little bit more into that. 
and not forgetting ourselves, not forgetting God, but let's talk about it. Caesar, one of the greatest um, Roman philosophers, even brought this, uh, some, some ideas about duty, when he wrote about duty, on, on, on duty is the title of the, his writing. And he suggests that duty can come from four different sources. Number one, a result of being human, right? Be human. We always say this, right? Be a humanizer. Be a person who is outgoing with everybody. Number two, it is a result of one's particular place in life. Your family, your country, your job, everywhere, right? Everywhere that we are, we have a duty. We have a commitment. Number three, it is a result of one's character. So if I am a person who is always labor, if who is a person who is um, showing myself on time, doing the right thing, that is it. Four, one's own moral expectation for oneself can um, generate duties as well. And this, again, is for us um, at Wikipedia. And we can Google more. We can always go more deep into it and learn a little bit more. But again, just for us to understand, it is the duty is... Besides, you know, looking at the word duty or, um, excuse me, or obligation, it's more, you know, the, the, again, this feeling of doing the right thing. And that's where we want to embark on. Tonight, most importantly, we'll be talking most of about chapter 17, item 7 from the book, The Gospel According to Spiritism. It was a passage brought by Lazarus in Paris. Um, in 1863. Before we go into the whole explanation by Lazarus and we analyze the whole thing, I want to give a very important example in this book. And we have it here at the bookstore, right here next to me too, <laughs> if, in case we need it. And it's the story of Joseph Bree, if we may call. And I would like to call a friend because when we have the opportunity to learn from somebody from their mistakes and they bring their mistakes and what happened to them to, our to enlighten our lives, those are truly friends. And they are not ashamed to say it. Do this because this happened to me. Do that because if you don't do it, this may happen to you. That is the, truly, the true friend. If I may, before we, before, because this is really important, it, at least I... I personally feel this way, and I don't want to put myself in the eye and, and put myself, but we hardly go back and, and remind ourselves how important these books are. And this book right here in particular, it's such a compilation, such a, a, a treasure to us, because part one of this book goes over different many things and many different things. Chapter one, for example, the future life and the nothingness that we always question. Um, the fear of death, um, heaven, hell, um, and the title, hence, you know, heaven and hell, and many other really important titles to all of us. Part two then goes into, of the book, goes into examples of spirits that have passed, that have lost their body, and now they're experiencing whatever they're experiencing based on their, on their experience here in life. And during the, the, during life, excuse me for one moment. Okay. And part two, um, it talks about chapter one of part two, talks about the passage. And then chapter two, happy spirits. It gives a, a, a list of all the happy spirits and what they're going through and what happened for them to be a happy spirit after the afterlife. Chapter three, average spirit, which we're going to be talking right here. Then chapter four, suffering spirits, and then suicides, repentant criminals and so on and so forth. So it's really important for us to not only analyze this right here, but if we have the chance to take this book and go through it. And we'll talk a little bit more about why we want to do such a thing. But here it is. This case right here, um, it was uh, a case of Joseph Bree where he was evocated by his granddaughter 20 years after he passed. 20 years. And uh, it takes place pretty much like this. The title is, An Honest Man According to God or According to Men, According to Ourselves Here. And the first question posed by the granddaughter is, Dear Grandpa, 
would you please tell me how you're doing in the world of spirits and give me any instructive details that might be useful for our progress? The kind and loving grandfather comes and says, anything you want. I don't, don't you love that feeling of your grandfather and the grandmother? Dear child, I'm expiating my disbelief, by, but God good, God's goodness is great and he takes circumstances into account. I am suffering but not like you might think. I regret not having taken better advantages of my time while on earth. I, I'm sorry, I just, I just supposed to be on earth there, for, er, on early, on earth. And then with her heart really filled of distress, or despair, whichever we may, we may say, um, she asked, how can you say you did not employ your time well? You always lived as an honest man. And he comes and says to us, because he's not only telling to the granddaughter, to all us, all the grandchildren, yes, in the judgment of others, but there is an abyss between honesty before men and honesty before God. You want to learn, dear children, dear child, so I will try to show you the difference. Can't go into the whole thing because it's, it's, it's a bit long and we have to respect time and, and go into the other part of the talk, but let me just give you some glimpses of what he says. Number one, right here, he, gives, uh, uh, he calls our attention to the difference of honesty here on earth and honesty before God, right? It's quite different. And he goes on by saying, talks about the laws here on earth, which is very easy for us to obey the laws. Number one, um, you know, we don't want to go to jail. We know that if we do something wrong, we're going to jail. So we try to do the right thing. We don't speed, we don't... We don't go. Um, uh, we don't cross a red light because we can hit somebody. We can. We don't. We don't try to do cer certain things because we know we're going to be reprimanded, right? So that's easy. And sometimes we know that if we can do these things because we, can, we can, because we can bend the law, right? We can get away from being call, called our attention. But he goes on by saying, "Not breaking the laws of men is not enough before God. Above all, one must not have transgressed the divine laws." get a glimpse of what the, what the divine laws are, and we have seen it here before. And he's saying, he keeps saying, a man who is honest in God's sight is one who, out of devotion and love, dedicates himself to a life of goodness and to the progress of his fellow men, who, animated by limitless zeal, is active in life, active in fulfilling the physical task imposed on him, for he must teach others the love of labor. Wow. <laughs> If anybody here, including myself, can do this, we would have a much better society, a much better life on earth. Because this right here is, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is that feeling of, okay, I get up in the morning, my first thought is, what can I do for society? What can I do for others? Right? And how many times do we do that? How many times do we get up in the morning, it's like, okay, the bills, and then I have to go to work, I have to get up now, I have to brush my teeth, I don't want to brush my teeth, and all those things, <laughs> right? Well, yes, I know some of you, I, I do, please don't take me wrong, <laughs> otherwise I would have rotten teeth, but, but that's, that's what crosses our mind, the children, correct? Go brush your teeth, oh no, I don't want it, and as Vanessa's saying, this is to all of us, to all of us. And then he, gets, he calls our attention to, let's stop using acid words. I'm using the, what the words that he said, a avoid acid words. Be patient, be benevolent, without ostentation. Do the right thing without ostentation, be, 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 you know, be, without showing ourselves that we have to, oh, I'm doing the right thing. No. And then he says, forgive. To finalize it, this one of the, one of the, um, the paragraph, he says, love God above all things and your neighbor as yourself. How many times we have seen this phrase since we start this, this um, Christ conscience every Saturday, Saturday here at the Spirit Set of Baltimore? And he asked himself, well, did I do that while on earth? No, I didn't. He says without no shame, knowing that now that he recognizes the error, he goes and says, with that, because of that, I have hope. Because now I understand, right? The problems are those who read this, and do not understand, and do not put into practice, then it's pretty hard. That's, that's a harsh life right there. And then he goes by saying, you must get rid of your, your imperfection, telling the, the granddaughter to do this, and tell others as well. 
through the power of good deeds and God's mercy will thereby, thereby extend over you. God's paternal eyes will take your trials into, into account and his powerful hand will obliterate your wrongs. Wow, once more, wow. We can stop right here and just say, okay, let's just follow his path. <laughs> but there's much, much, much more to learn and much more to go through. A pessimistic mind you know, would, would read such a thing, can read such a thing and, and say, you know what, it's too much suffering. It's too much to bear with. Because we were thinking that, okay, well, after I pass, it's going to be heaven. It's going to be great. I don't have to deal with the problems of life. I don't have to deal with the problems that I had before. Everything's perfect. But we see that it doesn't work that way. And we see also throughout life that suffering is everywhere. We look at the old civilizations. We look at our the contemporary civilizations. And we see that suffering is something that we all share. It's all around us. No matter what we do, we all go through and we all feel it. If I, if I go through you know, and ask each of you, I pinch myself first and I ask, okay, if I pinch you, you think it's going to hurt? And I, then I go and pinch you, it's going to hurt, right? No matter what happens, no, any of us here, we all feel suffering, we all feel pain. And, and that is something that is there. Unlike when we talk about happiness, some people may receive uh, a kind word and may be happy. Some people may receive money, $100, and may be happy. But some of them, and some people may say, oh, you know what, I want a, a $200 instead of $100. I want more. So we see that there is a difference here. Suffering is the same all throughout, and happiness and the good deeds may not reach other people the same way because of extensive, extensive ways that we have to do goodness, and also a, we have to you know, enter the idea of perception. But Lazarus here, was calling our attention, and we can use the same example that we just gave from, uh, from Joseph, that suffering is something among, uh, that is among us all, us all. I never forget, a friend of ours um, had a baby, and the baby used to bite everybody. Yes. Bite, literally. Literally, bite, yeah, like the Charlie, like Charlie boy. Yeah. Charlie bit me, right? Bite everybody. And then she, you know, the mother was like, okay, what am I going to do? Every person she sees, every person who cares, the child, you know, bites everybody. So <laughs> she takes the daughter to, to, to the doctor, and the doctor says, okay, when she, do, she does it, go ahead and bite her back. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the mother was all happy. Now, oh, my God, I won this moment. I won it. All right, bite me now, bite me now. So time went by, and the daughter went there. And, mm. So the mother was like, this is my time. This is my revenge bit the daughter again. After that, the daughter never bit anybody else. Anybody else. Because she was able to see and to learn that, okay, you're making somebody suffer when you bite somebody. And it's the same thing in our lives, right? If I, it, the, the, the suffering idea here, and I'm not trying to, to you know, be, the, again, pessimistic or try to bring this reality to ourselves in a harsh way, but really reminds ourselves the following that Lazarus says that equality in the face of suffering is God's sublime providence. He desires that all of us, his children, being instructed through their common experience, should not practice evil with the excuse of not knowing its effect. Because now you know. Now we know that if I do something wrong towards somebody, it's going to hurt, and I don't want to be hurt that way. So then I don't do it. Right? I don't, I don't, I'm not going to take a chance to... Um, to throw something at somebody because I know it's going to hurt. Perhaps we, don't, we never really got anything thrown at us at this lifetime, but perhaps in the past. What about our feelings, right? What about the small things of life? It's the same thing. So when we, when we have that common knowledge, right, which is suffering, then we take a step back and say, I'm going to do the right thing. When we talk about duty, it's like, okay, oh gosh. Now, if I don't do this right, Maybe it's going to hurt me, it's going to hurt other people, but let's dive into it. Analyzing this idea again that I want to bring to you guys that um, we, were, we were talking about the, the suffering. You know, even Spiritism, you know, and we read the, the, you know, many of the books, Andre Louise by Emmanuel, by Joanna de Angelis, all that they say, not all, I shouldn't say all that they say, many times they say, they bring this idea again of, of, of um, uh, despair, 
that we are going through this transition, that we are going through all the difficulties of life. But what Spiritism brings to us is what we're showing here. The now, right? And we go back and we study what? What caused the now, right? The before. And then Spiritism also brings to us, by calling our attention to study these feelings, these Christ feelings, as Vanessa said, it's not something that it, we're here trying to follow a man. We're trying to follow, to follow a path of goodness that will take us somewhere, that will take us out of this despair. And that is the, the beauty behind Spiritism, because it calls us in a different manner, in a different way, instead of saying, okay, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do something wrong, you're going to pay it. You're going to do something wrong, you're going to pay it. No, it takes us to the rational. Okay, this is happening right now to society or to ourselves or to whoever, because this, this, this could have happened without pointing fingers, without judging. And this is what we could do now in order for us to live a better life in the future. So it's a beautiful thing that just to bring to us that sometimes we may read a book, Action and Reaction, for example. It's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. You read some of the stuff, you're like, wow, is that true? It's like watching sometimes a horror movie, but then it, they take... They take, they take the, they take, this is my approach, please don't take me wrong. <laughs> but then they take, the, they spin and druzo and all the good spirits bring and say, okay, dear friends, let's not fall in the same temptations, right? By giving the example of what we can do. So it's beautiful. It's beyond the, uh, what we, we can expect. And we're almost finalizing this and um, uh, Kirsten next week will be fin we'll finalized with love. So we're almost there on that stretch. <coughs> Let's take this other part that, um, and analyze this other part that Lazarus brings to us. That duty is a moral obligation first to ourselves and then to others. Why does he start that way? That is a moral obligation first to ourselves and then to others. What have we just said a couple minutes ago? Love God above all things. Love your neighbors as you love yourself. We're going to leave the God part towards the end. But when he says, love others as you love yourself, it's the same thing here. It starts with us. I cannot love others if I don't love myself. I know we have to learn a whole lot about love. That's why we're leaving this for kids next week. But the obligation starts with us. So if I'm, if, not, if I'm not committed with my obligations, how can I be committed with others? How can I be committed with a situation, right? And we, we have to embark on a on, 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 on couple examples here in order for us to illustrate a little better. Um, because it's a feeling, when we talk about duty, it's a feeling that nobody knows that you're trying, that you're striving to do the right thing. Right? If, if, I, if, I, st if I say to you, okay, I'm, I'm really trying hard to be a happy person, nobody knows, really, how much are you trying. Even if you try the hardest, if you kill yourself, you know, to, to show that or to do so, nobody knows. So duty is really hard for us to uh, maintain this feeling or, or to exercise this feeling because nobody knows. Nobody really can perceive this feeling, right? It's something that if you succeed, nobody will ever say anything because it's inside of you. It's inside of you. When I get up in the morning and say, today I'm going to do the right thing, you, and obviously you don't say it, you know, out loud, <laughs> and, and you really try, you go to work and you do your duties, you do your duties at home as well, uh, for the best of your ability. If you're in, in engaged with uh, um, an institution, the spirit, you know, the, a, spi um, um, a spirit is center and you do your best, nobody knows. Nobody will ever say anything. Only you know your pain, only you know your efforts. And it's something that is very hard because many times we tend to stray away because of our imperfections. You know, sometimes it's easier for me to sit down and watch TV than accomplish what I have to accomplish home. And I'm talking about the mundane things here, which um, uh, Lazarus really, he puts in a different manner. But I'd like to talk about both because one will help us to understand the other. But it's easier for me to sit down and watch a movie instead of read a passage that will enlighten us like we just, we were seeing right here. So all these things, it really clashes against our, our will because of our imperfection. So we have to be diligent. As Lazarus says, it's something that it really has no time for us to, to stray away because we have to impose on ourselves. We have to work hard at it. But it's not that working hard that's, you know, that is ostensive, obviously, 
um, or it's something that we really have to push ourselves and be grumpy about it. No, let's try you know, to be natural. When there is a task for us to accomplish, let's do it you know, little by little. Let's go ahead and try the best. Let's take the extra mile, do a little bit more, do a little bit more. So here we are. If we take the, this, this explanation of loving others as we love ourselves, we then understand that the obligation starts with us first. We have to, be, we have to conquer obligations before we engage with obligations, um, with obligations with others, with the community, with the rest of the world. Here we are, just something for us to see, right? Instead of using the negative, you know, monks see no evil, hears no evil, says no evil, this is the opposite because if nobody sees it, nobody hears, that feeling side of you, nobody's going to say it anyways. And if somebody knows that you really try hard, sometimes we just take it for granted. Oh, that person? No, that person's trying to show off. No way. That person's trying to show off. That person getting here, on, you know, getting to the spirit center on time and helping and dedicate. No, oh, no, trying to show off. No, that person's really trying. And we take it for granted. We take it for granted sometimes for having one another as friends, as family members here with us. Because we think it's just, oh, okay, it's her obligation. It is an obligation, don't take me wrong. But we also have to emphasize and to really tell the person, thank you. Thank you for being here. You know, be connected with us. And uh, approve the good things, you know what I'm saying, and, and commend the good things as well. So Lazarus then comes to a couple questions that is very interesting. Where does this feeling begin? Where does, this, does it end? And, uh, and again, it's not somebody asking. He asks himself to explain to us that there is a limit. There's a beginning and there's a limit to all of us here for us to understand. And he says, let's try to digest this together. Duty begins exactly at the point where the happiness or tranquility of our neighbor, neighbor is threatened. We'll stop right here. How can we understand this? Where is this beginning? Let's take an example, bring an example. At work, for example, you have your boss, you have your manager, your boss, whoever, uh, your superior, and you're getting to work on time, you're doing the right thing, you are actually um, taking this task at hand and finalize everything before time, doing a little bit extra, adding to whatever report you may have, ev adding to whatever task you have that it was asked by it, uh, to you, and your manager himself is not helping. The person is just careless. Oh, I don't care, you know. In doing perhaps things that may jeopardize, you know, the company, or may jeopardize your stay at the company, right? So we see here that that we we have to do the right thing. So so we're not we're not threatening any the community, the work, and since we're giving this example. We're not, we're not threatening or the, the others who are below you as well because you have to do the right thing. Because if I don't do the right thing, if I don't cope with my responsibilities, the other ones who are working with me and who are working under me perhaps may suffer. So when I have that idea in mind, I do the right thing. I have to do it. Now, becomes now, now it becomes um, uh, a fact that I have to do it. In the same token that he says, that therefore terminates at the limit we would not wish to be passed in relation to ourselves. So that manager who is not really um, doing the right thing, then we have to say, enough is enough. Now you are hurting me, you're hurting, hurting my position as an individual. I'm not talking about as an employee because it goes against what? Our, you know, goodwill, right? and that person's not helping, then there's a limit, then you have to put a limit. Same thing on, on a relationship, many relationships. Well, I'm talking about only husband and wife, friendships as well, right? If I'm doing the right thing to cultivate the relationship and to be nice to the person, but the person is jeopardizing my feelings and hurting my feelings, then I have to put a cap on it. I'm not saying that we're going to go ahead and say, you know, go somewhere or live, you know, but then we have to say, enough is enough. I have tried my best. Now it's hurting me. Then we see the limit. Where does it start and where does it begin? So it's not something that we have to kill ourselves because we have our limitations. We do have our limitations and we want to know our limitations. We want to ask, okay, how far can I go with this? Because if I get up in the morning, which is good sometimes, get up in the morning and 
I'm being imposed to do something. Who likes to, to impose, be imposed on, act on something? Nobody does. So we have to cherish this feeling of doing the right thing naturally, little by little, smiling, right? And it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. But hopefully tonight we'll take a different approach on this. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he continues by saying, he continued by saying, duty is a law of life encountered in the smallest detail as well as in the elevated acts. And th there's a reason why I put that in there. <laughs> we see a little plant, right? A little tiny plant, and then we see what? The earth. The earth. How beautiful that is. A small thing that we sometimes we take for granted. Oh, that plant, right? And then we look at the huge, something huge as the planet Earth that sometimes we also take for granted and it's something huge. And that's what we'd like to talk about it. The smaller things first, the, the little things, even though Lazarus tells us that he's really looking into the higher things, not the mundane things, the, the work um, uh, acts that we have to accomplish after we read our job description, it here is the small thing, which is a good thing as well, because we, when, we, when we look at our job description, okay, I can do this, this, and this, and that, but I should do more. And then we go from there. But let's just bring an example that I heard recently <coughs> on, um, on uh, it was just a discussion that I was listening to, and I entitled this, this, this story, The Right Payment for the Extra Mile. It's really interesting because this man was called to paint a boat. Um, and you can imagine how a boat is, you know, um, something like this that is on the picture, just for so, so we can picture, to paint the, uh, the bottom of a boat um, and the inside as well. So he w went in there and analyzed the boat and, you know, took the time to do whatever, to prepare, do the right thing. And as he's getting to a, a specific part of the boat, in front of the boat, he sees a crack, a little crack. He was only paid to paint. He sees a little crack. And then he goes in there, you know what, let me take the time, okay, uh, whatever, you know, I'm going to make this, 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 this customer happy. So he goes in there, he fixed, he patches the, the whole thing, because he knows that that wouldn't, be, wouldn't, like, wouldn't look nice, the paint job wouldn't look nice, you know, once you see the crack. So he patches the, 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 the crack, and he goes around, continues on the other side, wait for it to, to dry it out and everything, and then he finalizes the job. And that he, he already got paid for a couple days later, excuse me, the owner of the boat comes by with another check and gives him another check. And he's like, what is this? I already got paid for it. What are you talking about? Do you have another job for me? He's like, no. It's an extra payment for you. And he said, well, but this is 10 times more what you, you paid me for the paint. I don't need this because you went in there and you fixed the crack of the boat. Oh, it was just a little crack. I just need a little resin, you know, a little, you know, work in there. It got done the same day, you know. It didn't have to work any other, any extra hour or anything like that. Well, let me explain to you what happened. I was the only, the only one who knew that the boat had a crack on the bottom of it. And I didn't ask you to, to fix it, but you fixed it. You paint the job, you paint the boat as I asked to do so. My son, my son, my, my two sons, in the other hand, did, that, did not know that the boat had a crack. And after they saw that the boat was painted, they left into the sea with the boat. I came running after, you know, I got to know that they took the boat into the sea. I was in despair. I, was, I didn't know what to do. But it was to my um, happiness and to my excitement that I saw the boat coming back. Mm -hmm. And I was really happy because if it weren't for you fixing the bottom of the boat, they would have sunk and they wouldn't be here right now. So there are certain actions in our lives that has no price for. This is a small token of, a, of, of, of um, being grateful for what you have done, for the extra mile. Because if it wasn't for the men fixing that little tiny hole, they would have sunk, right, with the boat. And sometimes we look at these things, it's like, do, have I ever been presented with a situation like this? I can guarantee you, every five, every minute of our lives, we are presented with, a, with a, a situation like that, that we can do more, that we can patch that little hole and say, now the job is perfect. And that's what we talk about tonight when we talk about duty. It's the little,
tiny example, little tiny extra mile that we go to do the, th the right thing for others and for ourselves. And how, how, how many times, an example that I give, recently we went through the renovation here, the SSB, and the clock was already pushing 1.30, 2 o'clock, and everybody's exhausted, but we kept going. We kept going. The next day, for our excitement, as we were talking, how, how are you feeling? I feel great. I, didn't, I don't feel tired at all. Because we all came together. We were, all giving, we were all giving that extra push for something much bigger than we are. For something that will benefit, and it's benefiting all of us right now, here uh, together. So it's that extra mile. This is the little things that, this is the little thing that Lazarus is saying right here. The smallest act of life. Because the man could have gone and say, okay, you know, he needs to pay me for that. I'm not wasting my resin or my material for, to do such a thing. But he went the, the extra mile. The same way, guys, that <coughs> I want to bring this before this, but it's just in the same way that we see the bigger things of life as well. We brought the earth. And an example that I like to give besides the earth, we wouldn't be able to live without it, is the sun. We'll also take it for granted. <laughs> but especially this time of the year, especially us here <laughs> in the North Pole, that we're not exposed to sun, we, we really need it. We really you know, wish that we could have more of the, 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 the warm weather and light as well. We all need that. Our body needs it. And we take it for granted. But let's, uh, let's analyze this with some of the explanations that we have gotten with the study of the book, The Evolution of Two Worlds. How did a spirit, a high mind, as um, Leon Denis on, this, on the book Here and Hereafter says that in an elevated characters, higher minds, higher spirits, the sense of duty is deep rooted, hence their road is an easy one to travel. How do they get to, com to be, as explained by André Luis, to govern a planet, a star, a constellation? How do they mind, how do they do it? Through the smallest thing. They went through the same process that we are going right now to get to that point. Was it easy? I'm pretty sure it wasn't. <laughs> Especially after we conquered the smallest thing and we get to be assigned bigger things, then we will also f be facing greater challenges. And then Lazarus continued by saying, our person's moral obligation towards God never cease. Taking us again back to that explanation that perhaps after this body right here, we think that's going to be an easy thing. No. We have to keep working. Perhaps after many millions of reincarnations that we have to face still, it's not going to be easy because we're going to be assigned greater tasks. But our sense of duty, it will be so well rooted in our hearts that we'll say, you know what? Today is a day that we're going to work collectively, right, with the other higher minds to make this bright light shine and to help other planets. Because if we didn't have the sun, I don't think we, the planet, we would perhaps be reincarnated someplace else, not here on Earth. Because it plays a huge role in our planet and the other planets as well. So then we see, I know there's two extremes. We're talking about a painter, and then we're talking about someone who, you know, a mind that is responsible for a star, a constellation. But it starts with the smallest act. It starts with doing the right thing, as we were Vanessa said, being a child. And, 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 and it may seem harsh to say such a thing, but take it whichever way we want. When children say, I got an A, and I wasn't the perfect student, by the way. I got an A. I, I'm on the owner's row. It's your duty. It's your duty. You know, I got up and went to work today, right? Please forgive me, but uh, and this isn't a, a personal example. I tell my kids that. I got up and we went to work today. You and your mother, we went to work today. It's our duty because we have a responsibility. We have a commitment to give you the means that you need in order for you to go to school. Right? Because that, was, that is exactly what my parents did to me. And I hope all the parents, you know, a lot of my friends, some of them, they didn't do so. Or some of them, they were harsher, actually. Um, but perhaps they learned a lesson. Because then it be, we, we are putting into our places... And we can say it nicely. It's your duty. What you're doing, I commend you. Great. Let's just walk this road together. Because it's not easy. But it's your duty. It's part of our, our, our life. It's our obligation. Taking again that obligation as something 
subtle, something that we are supposed to do, not to see it as a grumpy man and, oh my God, here again, I have to deal with this boss, I have to deal with this job, I have to deal with my teacher, so on and so forth. Otherwise, we're never going to get there, but we will because life will push us. The suffering that we were talking earlier today will push us and we'll have to bow our heads and do so. Even though there are people, sometimes an example here, that are people they go through their sufferings in their lives and they don't care. Once they get better again, like example, a, a physical deficiency or a problem they're going through, once they get better again, oh my God, they're on the top of the world. They're telling people what to do. They're telling people that it's not this way. It's my way or the highway. And life goes on to push them again to the abyss and say, you need to bow. You need to be a little bit more calm towards life. So here we have this feeling of, of, um, of duty, of this obligation, that many times it confronts us and say, oh my God, do I do the right thing? How do I do it? If we do it, sometimes we do it with that heart um, full of, of pretty hard, let's say. And, uh, you know, we question ourselves, you know, uh, what's easier? But on that sense, let's just take um, a couple minutes to analyze um, how we can become a better person towards this feeling. How we can become a better individual when to act in when we're facing the challenges of life. This chapter, chapter 17, it, it gives us, as we were saying at the beginning, the whole chapter is, it's, let's say, it's the, the, one of the perfect guidelines with everything else, obviously, um, in Spiritism, a perfect guideline for us to become a better individual, a better person. And I brought just some, just a glimpse of what is to be a good person, which is actually item three of this um, good, the, the, um, of this chapter of being perfect. Thank you, Vanessa. And on the at the beginning of item three, um, they say, uh, Kardec says, examine our conscience. From that point on, we can hide ourselves and say, no, I don't want to examine our conscience. I don't want to examine myself, right? And he poses the following questions. Have I, have I, and as you do so, as you examine your conscience, and we, we would say, do this through, perhaps the end of the day, so we can prepare ourselves for the next day, so we don't do the same mistakes. <laughs> but examine your, our conscience and say, and ask yourself, ourselves, have I violated any law? Literally, I mean, have I violated any law today? But when we say any, any law, it's not just the traffic laws, <laughs> the work descriptions, right? The things that we have to do on earth, the natural laws as well, right? Law of worship, work, reproduction, preservation, sorry, it's a little bit dark, destruction, social law, law of progress, equality, liberty, justice, love, and compassion. Have I violated any of these laws? We're not going to dive into it because it's too much to, to study. We have seen it here many, many times. The Spirit's book is at hand for us to kind of go through. Most of the Spirit's book is based on these laws, explanation on what it is for us to understand and as a guideline, as I said, uh, for us to understand. But that's what we are called to. Have I violated any law? Have I practiced any evil? Have I done something wrong? Can I avoid that tomorrow? Right? Have I done all the good that was possible towards others? Because one thing is for us not to do any evil, but the other thing is for us just to sit down and say, oh, enough is enough. I'm not going to do anything. That way I don't do anything wrong. Just by sitting there, by just being idle, right, it's you're already being, going against the, the, the natural law, the law of work. And it redefines, Kardec redefines what work is. The spirits do. do. How I, have I voluntarily disregarded any occasion to be useful, any possibility to be useful? Right? And when we ask this thing and say, okay, you know what? I had that opportunity to be used for. I had this opportunity to talk to this person, but I didn't do so. So tomorrow I'm going to do it. What I'm going to do it now, perhaps call the person and say, they need to be useful. And we want to say useful, the, there are many occasions, there are many ways for us to be useful. We think that is being useful um, uh, physically speaking, going there, taking something for a person, or cooking something, or giving something. It's nice. It's a nice act, but sometimes it's just a word. Sometimes it's just a, a, 
a, a, small, a small token that we can give someone. Does anyone has any complaint, not nay, sorry, any complaint to make about me? Oh, this one here, we would just <laughs> go back to sleep and not really um, continue with our reflection. But does anybody have anything to complain about me? Now, this is the thing too. What if they knew that I didn't take this approach here? Would they complain about me? Because sometimes people don't have anything to complain about me because I'm hiding myself under the sheets of, I'm following the law, I'm doing the right thing. But technically, if they truly knew what we're doing, mm. is it true? And then two, we have how many? Six, to top it off, here it is again. Have I done to others everything that I wish to be done to me? <laughs> have I done, it's, it, it, it's, it's, we complicate a life it, so much. But it's something so, so simple to really live by it. And we're going to take again, we're going to say it again. It's not about um, following a Christ, a person, but to follow a philosophy, to, following, uh, to follow a, a guidance, in, in, to put guidance in our lives and say, let me do the right thing. Let me do the right thing. Because I don't want to suffer. If I don't want to suffer, I'm certain now, because we all suffer, that others will suffer as well. So then we do the right thing. So then we take a different approach. We become a little bit happier when we are, um, are to do something, um, to accomplish something. Because sometimes it's pretty hard for us to, um, when we are called, since we're here together, to do a, a job at the, at the Spirit Center, a job at work, um, at home. We have to accomplish something. We do it. So here we are, we're grumpy, we're actually, so we have to put excitement, we have to really be excited about it. Um, it's the same thing when we go um, um, do something we like. How do we act? Pretty excited, right? How do we act when we go, we want to go to the gym and we want to lose those extra pounds? We get all excited, we go, because obviously you don't want to go and be all grumpy when you go exercise. Otherwise you're not going to do it. So we, we, you know, we push ourselves to the limit and say, I want to be happy. I want to accomplish this. And it's the same thing. And as we keep telling ourselves, things will change. And that's how we would like to end tonight, tonight, um, tonight's talk with this passage of the book, uh, Our Father, um, by May May. Um, per Vanessa Wu, actually, soon to have this in, in, in English as well. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book for kids, for ourselves. Um, calling ourselves big kids too, because I think we are, <laughs> and the children still uh, march in this lovely life. And it's actually an explanation, beautiful explanation uh, of the prayer, um, Our Father Who Arts in Avron. And in this passage right here, um, she talks about Jesus with uh, John, the son of um, Zebedee. And as he was among our, uh, us here on earth, uh, Jesus got to know that John was, um, was asked by his father, Zebedee, to accomplish something, to take a trip and go somewhere to do something for the family. And uh, it was actually um, a day where they, they were, they used to go to the mount and kind of walk around. It's like, you know, if we were to say nowadays, a chilling day <laughs> when we get together, we do things that we like. And he was really harsh. He was like, oh, gosh, uh, my father asked me to do this thing. And he went. He did what he was supposed to do. He had to walk for four days. <laughs> that was the journey. Going back and, you know, going down to wherever he had to do and come back. It was about four days. Well, can you imagine nowadays uh, asking ourselves, walk to this place for two days and then come back two days? I don't think, I think we would be pretty mad about the whole, you know, the whole thing. Sometimes we complain just being, having to drive certain places to do certain things. But that was his task, to do something for his father. And it was a pretty um, um, interesting task, not to say the least. And he accomplished, and he comes back, and Jesus sees that he has that grumpy face. The father was devastated. Because he was like, oh my God, here I am asking my son to help me, help the family, you know, to accomplish something here. And he's responding this way. It's not good. How many times we, do the, we go through the same thing on both sides, on both sides, 
asking and being the one who asked, who was asked, right? Um, and then Jesus sees the whole thing and then looks at John and says, okay, John, let me ask a question. Did you accomplish your duty? And he's like, yes. And then Jesus, I can imagine the, you know, Jesus looking at him and say, okay, John, did you, did you um, um, accomplish the, what God was asking you to do by helping your father? And he, he says, yes, I think I have done everything that I was supposed to do. And then Jesus looks at it again. As many times we see Joanna the Angel and Duvaldo says this, when Joanna comes, you know, smiling, something's going on. And then Jesus says, smiling to him, okay, I'm going to ask you to accomplish another duty. And obviously he's looking at, okay, what's going on? What is he going to say now? It's for you to accomplish the duty of being happy as you accomplish the things that God asks you to do. That's another duty. So Jesus is telling us that's another duty for us to accomplish our duties and being happy as we were doing so. And then after Jesus says that, he couldn't say anything else. He just gave up and said, enough is enough. And that as he changed, also Zebedee felt much lighter because the son could understand. Zebedee obviously too, right? So we see that here, Jesus calling, saying, no matter what we're supposed to do, let's do it. Let's do it with happiness. That's why we're supposed to be excited about the things that we have to do in life. The little, the smallest thing, the middle things. If we are able to accomplish new grounds, let's accomplish. Let's do it. The worst thing nowadays when we look at it is this idea that it is what I want to do and that's it. That's what society is bringing to ourselves now imposing on us and we really have to be strong not to fall into the temptations that I want to have a new car I'm going to get a new car if you know this person has it I'll have it let's do the right thing let's really be rational about the whole thing do we have to follow this idea of I do whatever I do the bare minimum or do we want to be the individuals when we're starting a job when we employ ourselves in a job right and we don't care about the job description, the first day of work, that you want to show that you can do it all, that you can do everything, right? Or the last day before you go on a vacation, that you want to give, make sure everything is nice, everything is well organized for the other ones who will follow you. So let's treat it the same way, with happiness, with really, um, <coughs> with, with uh, zeal that we have to um, present in our lives. We hope that at least the excitement that Jesus was was bringing to, to John here to do the task that are asked to do so, because as, as we do it, we'll be then connecting with, the, with, with God. By the smallest thing, we can then accomplish, we can then learn something tonight when we talk about this feeling of duty. For if you have any questions, um, any comments, we're open for, I think we have a couple minutes, Reverend Nissen. Anybody? When you, you had that uh, definition of uh, duty, that duty is a moral obligation towards mm -hmm. ourselves and towards others, I kept thinking if there is other type of obligation, like, so there's many. Uh, instead, moral, like social obligation, family obligation, law, <coughs> by law, or church obligation. And what is the difference if we fulfill all this list, checklist, no? have a checklist and check all this obligation, if we will accomplish our happiness there mm -hmm. with the duty? And the, in the final uh, uh, slide, you say exactly this, because if it's not coming from inside, if something imposed from outside, like he thought was his father was demanding, so it was a uh, duty coming from outside, obligation coming from outside, you're not going to reach happiness. 
So uh, one day we're going to rebel. Oh, today the church made something or the priest did something wrong. So now I'm against, I'm upset with this obligation. So it, it, there is this risk to one day I fail in my obligation because I'm upset with you know, some member of family or some law or some social uh, event. So I'm, you know, so I think the moral I think is important because it comes from inside, it's always evolving. We are evolving because it's part of our conscious. Right. So it is, uh, I think, the goal really. It's a very, it's a very good um, point, and it, you're right. Um, and what brought, what came to mind as you were saying such a thing, um, that struck me very much. So when, when I heard from Raoul, um, that we often ask ourselves, you know, how can I do charity? How can I help? Well, just look what's around you, analyze what's around you, and and you will see that we have to help people. We have to push people to the limit, as others as well will do to ourselves. How many times I, you know, I look at it here among ourselves, and I see things that I'm like, oh my God, the day that I can accomplish such a thing, I'll be a happy man. And as we do the smallest thing, we're also helping others. We're also influencing others. And quite frankly, sometimes we think that, okay, I have to go to um, another institution, another location, another house. I can do help, help my neighbors, but we're lacking in other areas at home. I'm not saying that I'm perfect, that I act, actually do all these things, because we're not. But at least try to look at you know, what's around. Try to look at the, what's being asked by your father, by your mother. And as we accomplish, we're also helping God. Because it may be, we may think that's a small thing, but as was described here, the task that was being asked by, by the father was something that was going to benefit the whole family. By benefiting the whole family, what happens? It benefits the universal family outside, right? Because we're not alone. And you're right. It is some, certainly something that this sense of, of a duty, it never stopped growing. It never stops growing. And that's what Lazarus brought to, brought to, brought to us very, very wisely. So, any other questions? Any other concern? I'll she <laughs> Uh, one of the things about duty is like uh, we need to start one day to accomplish our duty. You know, we cannot simply hi and say, I'm not going to do it today because sooner or later we need to do it, either we like it or not. So I was thinking probably at the beginning it's going to be very hard to smile and mm -hmm. to be happy. But the more we exercise it, the easier it will become, and it was, it's going to be one day in which is so natural, like the highest spirits, like a weird happiness is there, you know? It's like uh, when you talk about the school work mm -hmm. and the duty of a student to get an A. Well, it's not easy to study for the tests and to do homework and to go to those classes and wake up early every morning. That's, that's not nice. And we certainly were not smiling we're doing, when we we're doing that. Right. But the result of doing that is, is happy, is positive. So as soon as I start feeling the, those, these results, I will be accomplishing my duty with happiness. Mm -hmm. So the coming here is like a, let us start to give our the first step, even if it's hard or it's difficult, because it will, it will be, it will be give us like a, a good, good fruits at Perfect. the end. Thank you. Yeah, true. Kirsten, so we can analyze it. I, I, I think, Leo, and you can comment on is that it, like you were saying, duty is always in existence. There's never a moment, I think, in our lives, especially at the level that we're at, that duty doesn't always uh, present itself to us, whether we are in a relationship or whether we have children, there's always a duty that we have to attend to, right? But especially, it always goes back to us. Like the story that was shared today on Cardiac Radio about, that's in the Medium's book, part two, about obsession, about the two young ladies who are suffering under this, what they came to know was um, a spirit disturbance, coming to disturb them at their home. The spirit was throwing things around, and here they were suffering. Finally, they were so upset, so 
in uh, disarray that they reached out to the Spirit Society of Paris and said, look, we need help. The Spirit's obsessing us. We don't know what to do. And it turns out that the, basically a mentor came through and said, look, those two girls, it's not by chance that they're quote-unquote suffering. They need to change themselves. It is their duty first to look inside of themselves and ask themselves exactly what you put on the screen. Am I being charitable? And he, the Spirit pointed out to them, saying they need to ask themselves, are they being charitable to everyone, to their neighbor? So I think it, it's a duty, right, right, for us to always ask ourselves, especially when we're suffering, am I doing, have I done all that I can do mm -hmm. in my life? <laughs> well, as, uh, right. with, to further elaborate on the story, that it turns out that the, the high-order spirit that Kardec calls, the high-order spirit came to, to say that these two girls were slanderers. They were gossipers. They would talk ill about their neighbors. They would gossip about people. And they said that the spirit that's obsessing them is seeking revenge for all the many lifetimes of gossip and slandering that they've done. That they might have appeared to be very good girls, quote unquote, but that they are very accustomed to this habit of gossiping. And so we think about this when we talk about our duty towards our neighbors to be kind, to be charitable, and to, and the Spirit said very specifically, they need to watch their tongue and how they use their tongue and their thoughts as well. He said specifically, our, their thoughts and their tongue. So we need to watch, it's a duty for us to watch our thoughts, our feelings, and what comes out of our mouth. Because just, just like Jesus said, it's not what goes in that makes man unhealthy or, or um, bad, but it's what comes out mm -hmm. that can harm us, right? And I thank you, Kirsten, because this brings me to the last couple of remarks that I would like to make. Um, taking back to the discussion that we had earlier, as far as, you know, how beautiful spiritism is, how beautiful the science is, and what brings to us. Now we know that is the duty here in between the mundane things, the small things, but also it gives this other example that you're given right here, that now I know better that it's not just the incarnated ones. It's my duty as well with the universe and the discarnated lives as well. Because if I do something wrong as they were doing, being slandered, they're gonna actually go under the influence of others who are persecuting them, right? So it's my duty to do the right thing, not only for us here, but for those that are on the other side, for those that have done something in the past. As many times we see it and we hear, one of the greatest shares that, it w that we can do is to spread spiritism in a nice way, in a nice, loving, kind way, because we don't want to impose anything. It's you know, to go and bring this to other people. And with this, you know, I truly feel, as I said at the beginning, that it is my duty to be here and bringing this to you guys, because once we see this, it's like, well, what? I have a responsibility. But it's a really happy responsibility that we have with one, one another. So that is the last um, uh, couple comments that I would like to make and, and hopefully this will bring you comfort and help you gear up to get up tomorrow morning and say, you know what, I'm gonna do the right thing. Whether in the smallest, the highest thing, and perhaps one day be in the highest order of spirits and accomplish great things as well. Go ahead, Kirsten. <coughs> The, it's great. I, I think that the talk is very empowering. But one other aspect that we cannot negate nor neglect is how and what happens when we don't do our duty, like the example of the girl or the two young ladies who were gossiping. But one other specific thing we have to remember is that our thoughts, life can go two ways for us. If we attune our minds to the good spirits, it can go pretty good. But if we attune our minds to the negative ones, it can go pretty bad. And that's where obsession happens. That's why this story is directly in the part in the medium's book that's entitled Obsession. Because the minute we cease to do our duty and be charitable towards our neighbor, we attune our minds exactly like a radio station. You go there, you tune the station, mm -hmm. and you tune into something that's a million miles away. Maybe not a million, but you get the idea here. And it's that simple, but it's the same thing. So before we decide to not do our duty, before we decide to go and open our mouth or think negative things, see your mind as a beautifully created radio station. What station do you want to be tuned to? Because then you will serve as a vehicle for the good or the bad. So Kardec really, radio. Car yes, <laughs> <laughs> Kardec radio live. Okay, one one option, right? Every Saturday morning. <laughs> exactly. So that's something we, that should 
be always in our minds that, okay, maybe you think, ah, oh, Leo, you're too, you know, oh, give me a break. This is all so, you know, for the birds. But no, the other s very serious aspect that we cannot neglect is spirit obsession. Uh -huh. And it occurs with, with the best of us and the worst with us, but it, depending upon how we choose to live in our inner world, because as you said, I mean, not to take over your talk or anything, but we can, we can present to others that we appear to be loving and kind. And the, the key about these two young ladies, I apologize for taking so long, was that they appeared to be quite good. They were, they were good girls, quote unquote. For the eyes but of society. They were, exactly. But in actuality, they were not. They were not. Yep. Behind closed doors, they were another two young ladies. Thank you, I'll pass the word into Vanessa. Thank you Thank so you. much, Thank Leo. You. It was very inspirational. A lot of good food for these beautiful snow wheat. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because as we know, this is Christ conscious feeling. This, the higher we evolve, the more we appreciate duty. For higher spirits, discipline is fun. For low spirits, discipline is bad. So if we don't like discipline, we have here a good thermometer. Going to school shall be fun. It is fun. Doing exam is fun because it tests our capacity. I love it. It's great when we are tested. And the Dalai Lama always said, he himself as well, that we in the 21st century need to get another understanding of discipline. And that's what spiritism is saying here. It's exactly what Jesus said. It's this happy sense of being a good child of God. In this book, Jesus tells us a story about a man who didn't like it. It's the book, Jesus in the Home. And talks exactly about discipline and duty. And I don't want to say this because Leo was, was not complete. He was more than complete. Very clear. But the spirits are here and they're saints. Never too much to go an extra mile in the understanding. And they say there was a guy named that was like an inconstant worker. Every teacher he had, he was like, I don't like this teacher. This teacher is too strict. I don't like that teacher. This teacher is too demanding. I don't like this teacher or this master. And then it's like, okay, if you don't like anybody, you're never going to learn anything. And then Jesus says, these are Jesus' words, believe it or not, said by Neo Lucio, the spirit, through Chico Xavier. He says precisely this. Because the inconstant worker went on to suffer the consequences of his non-duty feelings. As Kirsten said, we suffer pretty bad. And Jesus paused and then concludes. Those who are under the control of individuals who are strict disciplinarians will achieve excellent results if they can take advantage of their severity. Like a piece of unformed wood under the touch of the beneficial plane, blessed is the hand that instructs and corrects. But even more blessed are they who allow themselves to be shaped under its renewing and perfecting touch because the masters of the world always object to learning from other masters, but the work of the good, when accomplished by all, remains forever. So let us bless. If there is anybody in our lives who is a strict disciplinarian, take advantage, obey, follow. Otherwise, we're going to miss a lot of opportunity. So if we have parents, teachers, even presence of peer spirit, spirit centers who are strict disciplinarians take advantage <laughs> of the severity because the good spirits, think of Emmanuel, looking at Chico Xavier, poor, without a mom, no major credits. He was just 17 and saying, oh, Emmanuel, 
I really want to do good things with spiritism and for spiritism. Any man who comes, strict disciplinarian. And he's no sorry for Chico. He says, you do? Imagine somebody coming to the scene. I want to help. And we come say, oh, you want to help? Like Emmanuel, we would say, easy. Discipline, discipline, discipline. And the person would get out immediately. Chico was blessed because he took advantage of the severity of Emmanuel. And blessed are we if we do so. If the spirits say, go do charity, you better do it. Because if you don't, you're going to suffer and continue suffering. We better do it. So the good spirits here, they're inviting us tonight to meditate very deeply tonight. If we want to be happier, let us embrace this 11th step into this Christ consciousness. Because the next level is love. Next week, when Christian comes here and opens that understanding of love. Let us remember that to be dutiful, we need to be humble. And that's why Chico Xavier was so graceful. He didn't turn to Emmanuel and said, Emmanuel, don't you see I'm poor? Don't you see I don't have a degree? No, he said, yes, master. Or no help, or health. At the time, he was pretty healthy yet, because he was only 17. And, but he kept on being very faithful and dutiful, as you said. Even at times, he was unhealthy, apparently unhealthy. So let us meditate on this deeply. And as Leo said, let us gr be grateful to especially the strict disciplinarians we have in our lives. If they are our parents, grandparents, neighbors, teachers, boss, whomever, let us say to them tonight a prayer of gratitude, because bless are we having them in our lives. Let us pray as we prepare ourselves for the passes as well, and enjoy the company of the loving spirits in our lives.